Welcome back everybody. This is Rob from Crown of Thorns. Today is Tuesday, June 15th, and I'm going to try to film uh, both Bible study videos for this week today. So in the next video, or this video, I don't know which one's going to come first, but the reason why I'll be wearing the same clothing isn't because I wear the same clothes every day, but because I'm filming two videos on one day. And that's because today is, or this week, is going to be an especially busy week. I have a lot going on. Um, yeah, I won't get into all of that. But I wanted to say thank you to everyone who wished me a happy birthday yesterday, uh, which was June 14th, Flag Day. Um, a better day to be born I cannot think of. So, uh, thank you everyone for that. Uh, we're going to jump right into this. It is 12.23 as I start filming this. I'm trying to keep these around an hour long. We'll see how that goes. We'll see how it happens. Today, we're gonna to talk about the judgment seat of Christ versus the great white throne judgment. And when you read your Bible, and hopefully you are, and hopefully it's a King James Bible, you'll see uh, sometimes the Bible will talk about the judgment seat of Christ, and other times it will talk about the great white throne judgment they are not the same, okay? There is a difference, a huge, huge difference between the two. Uh, the same way that uh, the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdom of God. Uh, some people like to say that those terms are interchangeable and they're not. I can't think of anyone right off hand or any denomination or church or whatever that claims that these two are the same but there's probably somebody out there, or some church or denomination or something, who likes to perpetuate the lie that these are interchangeable. They are not. These are two separate events for two separate groups of people, and they will entail two radically different end results, okay? Uh, very, very different. So, the judgment seat of Christ, we're gonna start there, and right off the bat, I'm just going to tell you what the difference is, or what each one is, okay? But before that, uh, remember, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is the gospel encapsulated, the means by which we are saved. If you haven't looked at these verses, I encourage you to do so. If you haven't looked at them in a while... I encourage you to revisit them. Um, these verses, 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, is Paul talking, and he's telling us the means by which we are saved, which we know uh, is the who and the what. The who and the what. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to know who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh, okay? Jesus is God. Jesus stepped out of eternity, placed himself within the limitations that we exist in every day, time, space, matter, came down here as a man and died for our sins. That is the what. We must trust and believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believing upon that atoning blood that he shed to wash away our sins. That's the who and the what. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 talks about the gospel, the means by which we are saved. How that Jesus died on a cross. That is how you get saved. It's not a sinner's prayer. It's not asking Jesus into your heart. It's trusting on the blood of Jesus and knowing. And in fact, we'll put that verse up here like we always do. Romans 3.25 talks about trusting on the blood. And then Ephesians 1.13, which says that once you've trusted on that blood, you are sealed, you are saved, and you cannot lose your salvation. Okay? Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that. Check out my other videos about eternal salvation, where we talk about how you cannot lose your salvation because it does not depend on us, thank God. But today, Judgment Seat of Christ versus the Great White Throne Judgment. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And it says, 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So, the judgment seat of Christ, right off the bat, I'm just going to give it away. The judgment seat of Christ is for, all right, we'll put it, judgment seat of Christ, abbreviating, is for saved people. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ is for saved people. All right? And it takes place after the rapture. After the rapture. So, what does that imply then? After the rapture. Well, the question I had, and I had, I had to do a little bit of research, and I'm glad that I did, because I hadn't even thought about it until I started writing this up. What about the people that have already died and are in heaven? Now remember, the people who have died before us, okay, somebody died yesterday or 100 years ago or 4,000 years ago, those people, okay, um, their bodies are still on the ground, their soul is in heaven. They are disembodied at this point. When Jesus comes back at the rapture, it says the dead in Christ will come out first. So those disembodied souls that are in heaven right now, they get their bodies, meet them in the air, and it becomes a glorified body. Then we, which are alive, will join in the clouds, and we get our glorified bodies. My point to all that is, those souls that are in heaven right now have not, have not stood before the judgment seat of Christ yet. Okay? Because the judgment seat of Christ, as we, as we, as we'll soon find out, isn't to determine if you get to come to heaven, if you get to stay there, or if you're if you're still saved. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. We're going to see what it does have to do with here pretty soon. But the people who are in heaven right now have not stood before the judgment seat of Christ yet. That won't happen until the rapture, when all of us are up there as well. Then all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it says here in verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. All right? Let's take a look at another verse. Go to Romans 14. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. And it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account to himself to God. Now, all of us who are saved will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a time coming, though, and Jesus is alluding to this, or Paul, but he's talking about what Jesus had said, where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is, is Lord. That comes back here a little bit later. But, so Paul's kind of, uh, he's encapsulating both events, okay? The judgment seat of Christ, remember, saved people and after the rapture. So, before I go any further, what about the great white throne? Let's write, let's see what that one's about. The great white throne throne judgment what is the great white throne judgment well that is for lost sinners lost sinners meaning people who never got saved people who never got saved or during this period maybe were saved but lost their salvation because in this dispensation you can lose your salvation if you take the mark of the beast, as an example. Um, and also, this event will take place after the Millennial Kingdom, and I'm going to abbreviate that, MK. So, Judgment Seat of Christ, save people after the Rapture. The Great White Throne Judgment is for lost sinners after the Millennial Kingdom. Millennial Kingdom, remember, is 1,000 years when Jesus sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. And we, who are raptured up, 
get to rule and reign with him. But the, at the end of that thousand years, notice I put end of time, that has a dual application, that's the end of time, but also that is the end of time. Time will no longer exist. We go into eternity. There will be no time. All right? And at that point, those who never got saved, those who are in hell currently, will come up out and stand before this great white throne. We'll get to that. All right? So two separate events happening at two different periods of time for two different sets of people. And like I said, the end results are drastically different. We'll get to that in a second. All right, but let's keep moving on with the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 27. What does it say? And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Now, just as Jesus talking, and he's referring to himself, hath given him authority. Who gave him that authority? Well, God, the Father, gave Jesus, the Son, Son of Man, uh, the authority to rule, to, to judge at this judgment seat of Christ. So, that's who we'll be standing before, before Jesus. Jesus is going to be... Uh, on the, uh, that judgment seat, and we will stand before him. Why? Well, we're going to get there. Uh, let's go to Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1. This is one of my most favorite verses. I love the book of Romans, and chapter 8, 9, and 10 especially are just phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, books, phenomenal chapters within a phenomenal book. All right? I encourage you to read Romans for a number of reasons. One, because it's a book from Paul, and Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, remember Romans through Philemon. So that's the first reason. Secondly, Paul addresses a whole bunch of issues, uh, topics regarding Jews and Gentiles, and the whole grafting in of Gentiles. And, and he explicitly states, God is not done with the Jews. God is not done with the Jews. He goes back to dealing with the Jews during the tribulation. So it it uh, discredits anyone whose argument, um, those who believe in replacement theology. And, and I don't want to get into that today. But anyway, just know that Romans is a great book. So check that out. And we'll do a Bible study on that sometime about replacement theology and dual covenant theology. But that's for another day. Remember, I'm trying to stay on track. Try not to run too many rabbit trails today. We'll see. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, who would that be? Those who are in Christ Jesus, that's us, the church. We're in the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. Um, those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, we are in our flesh. We're trapped here until the day we die. So we do sometimes uh, chase our flesh, meaning we do things we shouldn't do. When we sin, that is our flesh. All right? There's a new spirit inside of us. Okay? So when it says those who walk after the spirit, it doesn't mean that we're perfect and that we're without sin. We're not. But our sins are forgiven because we've trusted on the blood of Jesus. But the interesting part is the first line. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those of us who are saved, there is no condemnation. Well, what's condemnation? Well, condemnation usually refers to being cast into hell. Okay? Or some sort of eternal punishment, again. But there's no condemnation in us. We are found without blame and without fault. How can that be? Because the blood of Christ has been applied to our account. Not because of anything we've done. Okay? So when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I want you to know this has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're getting into heaven. If you're at this judgment seat, you've made it. You are in. And like we've talked about before, it doesn't matter if you got saved 10 seconds before you died or if it was 100 years that you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter. You've made it. You trusted on the blood. You're now standing for Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. And we sometimes are intimidated by words like judgment. And sometimes it makes sense to be. 
But we're going to find out that this has nothing to do with our salvation. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to make it into heaven. You're there. You raptured up or you've already died. If you're standing before Jesus at the seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, you're in. All is well. What's going to happen now is he's going to determine your rewards. And we've talked about that in a couple of videos briefly. That when we do good things here on earth, depending, for, depending on our intentions and our motivation, we're putting up, we're laying up treasures, rewards in heaven. Okay, and we're going we're to talk about some of those. Uh, there are different crowns, there are different rewards that you get based on what you do. When you uh, take the gospel to people, you're getting a reward if you're doing it for the right reasons. As crazy as it, as it sounds, uh, me doing this video, okay, so long as I'm doing it from uh, the right, for the right reasons, this is me laying up treasures in heaven. And when you share the video, believe it or not, that's you laying up treasures in heaven if you're doing it for the right reasons. All right? So Romans 8.1. Now go to John, back to the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at... Now actually, let's go to 1 John first. So the epistle, 1 John, toward the back of your New Testament. And we're going to look at chapter 2, verse 2. All right? And it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. All right? So, again, it's just reiterating who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And if we're standing here, if we've trusted on the blood of Christ, we're standing at the judgment seat of Christ, we're already in heaven. We're good. It's not about uh, determining if you get to stay or not. All right? Let's take a look at Galatians. 2.16. Galatians 2.16. I have to say that um, outside of Romans and Hebrews, all of the books of Paul are my favorites. Uh, you know, especially, well, I should say especially, but for certain reasons, I'll get into another day. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I just love those four books. Um, why did I say that? I'm buying time while I try to find this verse I'm looking for. Alright, Galatians 2.16. This is important. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, if you are trying to maintain the commandments and the law, if you are thinking that anything you do is helping or assisting or part of your salvation, you are not justified. Okay? It says, we are not justified by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. If you are trying to keep the law, if you are trying to earn your way into heaven with good deeds, you're not going to get there. That's a promise from the Bible. The only way you're going to get there is to come to Jesus Christ and trust on His blood. So, what that means is, when you get up here to the judgment seat of Christ, that means that you're already in. Because you trusted on the blood and nothing else. Okay? So this is not, again, this is not to determine if you get to come to heaven stay in heaven it has nothing to do with your salvation it has everything to do with rewards based on the things that you've done the good things that you do all right let's go to john gospel of john we're going to look at chapter 10 verse 28 um yeah we'll start at 28 all right and i give them eternal life and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now that's one of my favorite verses for evidence that you cannot lose your salvation. If you honestly think that you or anyone else have any power at all to pluck yourself out of the hand of Christ and the hand of God, you're delusional at best. I recommend psychiatric help, okay? But find yourself a good Christian psychiatrist, okay? Just a recommendation. I give you that information for free. Um, so... Again, this is not about salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. If you're up here before the judgment seat of Christ, that means you're saved. You made it. Okay? And you can know that you're saved. 
and there's other verses we could go to I don't have time now but we'll we'll do that sometime how you know you are saved we, we that's the that's the great thing about being a Christian is that we can know we are saved see the Muslims they don't know if they're gonna make it to heaven the Buddhists are not sure the Hindus maybe okay Christians can know that they're going to heaven that's what sets Christianity apart from all the other religions okay well, unless you're one of those people who believe you can lose your salvation, then, then you don't know. Then you basically put yourself in the same category as the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, and whomever else. Why would you want to do that? I don't want to. It says in the Bible we can have assurance of our salvation, assurance that we're going to make it to heaven. Okay? That's what sets Christianity apart. In fact, we're going to look at Ephesians 1.13. Let's go there. Ephesians 1.13 What does it say? We've gone over it before. It's a great verse. In whom ye also trusted after, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. A Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit promises that he's going to seal you and keep you and dwell within you. So you can't go to hell if you have the Holy Spirit within you. That would be sending God to hell. That can't happen. And if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you can't break that seal. No one can. Therefore, you cannot lose your salvation. All right? I'm reiterating a lot of stuff that we've talked about before because it, it ties into what we're going to uh, talk about next. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. All right. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There it is. The hope of eternal life. We have hope in eternal life because of what Jesus did. We have hope in eternal life because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We have hope because God has extended a tremendous amount of grace toward us. And we talked about that before. Has salvation always been the same? You know, dispensational salvation. And we agreed that yes, it's always been at, by the grace of God. But there's been other conditions in different dispensations. But if someone says that it's always been about the grace of God, I would agree with that. Okay? But there's just other things that came along with it in different dispensations. But yes, God shed his grace. Jesus took our place and the Holy Spirit now lives within us. Okay? That's what this verse is talking about. One more. Romans. Go to the book of Romans. We're going to go to chapter 11. Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So again, Jesus is just reminding us that our salvation... Hold on a second. Keep losing. Alright, hold on. Technical difficulties is what they call that. I gotta find my spot again. Oh boy. Okay, here we go. Alright, we'll read that verse again. Uh, Romans 11 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Again, he's just reiterating that our salvation is not based on anything that we do. It is based on grace. Uh, grace and faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Okay? That glare. That glare bothers me. I can see it right there. Two spots. And every week that I do these, they're always there. They're haunting me. Oh well. Anyway. So, Romans eleven six, yet another verse. Now, 
I'm going to prove to you and show to you that if you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, it's not anything you have to worry about as far as, hey, did I make it? You've made it. You're there. It is about rewards. And why are rewards important? Well, because it demonstrates and reflects, one, the good things that you've done, the things that you've done to take the word and to draw people to Christ, and three, what your intentions were. Why did you do those good things? And when we stand there before the judgment seat of Christ and our works are tried by fire, okay, if what you did was just for self-glorification or to get a pat on the back, it will be burned up. It will be as hay and stubble is what it calls, what, it, what the Bible says. So you won't get any reward for that. You, your reward was what you did here on earth. That's it. If you did it with the right intentions, then there's you know gold and silver and precious jewels, things like that. And I think what we'll get to do is we'll get these rewards and then we'll get to take them and present them to Jesus. So when you think about everything that Jesus did for us, this is our chance, this is our opportunity, our way to say, Jesus, thank you. I tried to do as much as I can for you and here are my rewards. I want you to have them and hopefully you have a big armful you know, a wheelbarrow, something. But if you did it for all the wrong reasons or you just didn't go out and do anything and you walk up to Jesus and you hand him a 50 cent piece, that's all you have, you're still going to make it to heaven. You're already there. But would you feel good about that? I wouldn't. I tell you, I want to have as many rewards as possible. Not for me, because I'm not keeping them anyway. I'm going to hand them over to Jesus and I want to give him as much as I can because he gave me everything. He gave me eternal salvation. That's why it's important. That's why rewards are important. That's why good works are important. Not for salvation, but because we get to hand those over to Jesus as a way of saying thank you. And, you know, I tried to do as much for you as I, ca as I could. That's what this is about. So let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 12 through 15, right? And this is where uh, Paul is telling us exactly what I was just saying, all right? Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Again, your good works, that's going to be the end result. Your, your good works are either, uh, you know, gold, silver, and precious stones, which when tried by fire, those preserve. They stay good. Now, if you take... Your, your good works and you do them for the wrong reasons, then you have wood, hay, and stubble. When you try those by fire, obviously they burn up. You have nothing left. Okay? So that's what he's talking about. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? Well, we always talk about the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. We're talking about the day of Christ. Remember, this is after the rapture. The day. The day of Christ. The rapture. The day of the Lord is out here, remember. The millennial kingdom. All right? Um, yeah, the day shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So there it is. Paul is telling us, hey, depending on the kind of work you did, depending on your intentions, what your motivation was, You'll either get some gold, silver, and precious jewels, which you can then turn over to Jesus, or if you did it for the wrong reasons, okay, then you're going to have wood, hay, and stubble, and you're not going to have anything to hand over to Jesus. Now again, it says, uh, he shall suffer loss, and that you don't get those rewards, but he himself shall be saved. You cannot lose your salvation. If you're standing up here, the judgment seat of Christ, you're already in. Even if you've done zero for Jesus, so don't let people tell you otherwise. You could get saved today. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, but if you chose to do zero for Jesus, you're still saved. Still going to heaven. But you won't have anything to show for it once you get there. You're not going to have those crowns and those rewards that you can hand over to Christ. Okay, which could be embarrassing and, and shameful. Okay, but you're still going to heaven. You're still there. That doesn't change. And Paul confirms that, which confirms again, your salvation has nothing to do with your works. It's by faith alone. 
All right? Let's take a look at another one. Let's go to Matthew. Look at chapter 6. Matthew 6. We're going to look at verses 2 through 4. Matthew 6, verses 2 through 4. Therefore, and this is Jesus talking, when thou doest thine alms, which alms just means when you do your good deeds, or when you, when you tithe, you don't have to tithe, but remember, this is a different dispensation. Anyway, when you're doing good things for Christ, whether it be your time, talent, or treasure, okay? When you're doing good things for Christ, your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Again, what are your intentions when you do something nice? Are you taking a selfie? Are you posting it on Facebook? Are you telling all your friends and family about it? If so, that is your due reward and nothing more. When you get up here to the judgment seat of Christ, those will be burned, tried by fire, and you'll have nothing left. That is wood, hay, and stubble. You did it for all the wrong reasons. Okay? That's what Jesus is saying here. But when thou doest alms, let not thy, life, that thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth it in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. When you do something nice for someone, the last thing you should do is go around telling people about it. That's between you and God and the person you did something nice for. Don't tell people about it. When I see celebrities on TV talking about how they gave millions of dollars or they donated some food or whatever else, I think, first of all, you know what? You're making enough money you could end all of it if you really wanted to. Secondly, why are you on TV talking about it? I'm not impressed at all. And you know what? If you're a saved person and you make it to heaven, God's not going to be impressed at all either. Do nice things in secret because what God sees you doing in secret, he will reward you openly right here, the judgment seat of Christ. And I would much rather get rewards and recognition up here than down here on earth. All of this is going to burn up and nobody's going to know at some point about any of this anyway. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. And Jesus warned it, warns us against that. Don't do it. Right, let's take a look at another one. Uh, go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We'll look at chapter 4. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 8, it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, right here, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. His appearing, I will see the rapture. So if you've been doing good things, laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, what is the crown of righteousness? Well, he's telling you this isn't exactly the same as the rewards. The crown of righteousness, when you got saved, okay, when you got saved, a cloak of righteousness was placed over you. When God looks down at you now, he sees the cloak of Jesus Christ over you, okay, if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, not so good for you. But anyway, so it says that those, okay, unto all of them that love his appearing. Well, we as saved Christians should be looking forward to and highly anticipating this day right here, the rapture when Jesus comes back for us, his appearing. So if you're loving his appearing, you must be saved because I tell you what, if you're not saved, you're not gonna love his appearing because you are going through seven years of tribulation. And you may not know it now, but you will soon find out, okay? So if you love and look forward to this, the day of his appearing, it's because you're saved and you will get the crown of righteousness, okay? Let's take a look at some more. 1 Peter 5.4 1 Peter 5.4 And it says, 1 Peter 5.4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The chief shepherd, of course, is Jesus. When he appears, you shall receive a crown of glory. So again, that's another crown that we get. See, when you're saved, you're automatically going to get some crowns. Now, the rewards are something different, but you're going to get some crowns just for being saved, just because you trusted on the blood of Christ. You're going to have that crown, which 
excuse me, you can hand back over to Jesus and say, because of you, Jesus, I'm here. Period. Because of you, Jesus, I'm here. Nothing that I did. If you, again, think that you have any part, even a half a percent part in your salvation, you're not going to make it. Okay? Because you're basically then saying, well, I, I get to share in that crown. I, I got here, lest any man should boast. Okay? If you played any part in your salvation, if you could, then when you got to heaven, you would boast about that. You would. You would say, hey, part of it was me. I did this. I did that. I get to keep some of these rewards. It has nothing to do with you. Nothing. All right. Let's go to James. James, and we're going to look at chapter 1. Verse 12. James 1.12. And it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So when you, here's another crown that you get. How? When you endure temptation. Uh, one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We'll take a look at that in a second. It has nothing to do with this, but it ties in with this verse. Anyway, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them who love him. Those who love him are those who are saved. Okay? If you're saved, you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you get saved. Okay? And whenever you endure temptation, in, in, what, endure temptation, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to the temptation. But when you endure temptation, but don't actually do whatever you're being tempted to do, you get another crown. A crown, uh, what does James say? you receive the crown of life. Yet another crown that you can someday hand over to Jesus. Okay? Um, rabbit trail, I know. But let's take a look at this verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, great verse. And something that everybody should keep in mind. Because we all get tempted. We all have temptation. Uh, maybe on a daily basis. Whether it's alcohol or whatever. Drugs. Whatever your temptation is. Whatever your vice is. You will face temptation, and we have to be strong and turn away from that. And this is what, what Paul said, revealed by Jesus, of course, um, about temptation. So, rabbit trail, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted. Suffer, remember, means allow. Will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So whenever you're facing temptation, God will never give you more than you can handle as far as your temptation goes, and he always provides a way out. You can always say no, take the left turn, whatever it is. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, one of my favorite verses. All right, back to what we're talking about. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 10. So Revelation 2, 10. What does it say? Revelation 2.10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the doctrine behind this. There's a whole lot you can unpack in that verse. Um, and in, within the book of Revelation, which someday we'll touch on. So I'm not going to dig into all of the doctrinal uh, applications there. The point being, okay, be faithful unto death, I will give thee a crown of life. Again, the crown of life comes up, okay? These are just different rewards and crowns that you can earn just by being saved and by doing good works for the right reasons, okay? Which goes back to the judgment seat of Christ. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. Trying your works by fire, and whatever you have left, those rewards, those crowns, you then get to hand those over to Jesus. It's it's a way of saying thank you, okay? So doing good things, yes, is important. Good works are important. It has nothing to do with salvation, but it does have to do with these rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Um, in, in These works are for God's glory, okay? We're doing good things for the glory of God, not to glorify ourselves, is to do 
is to uh, show people, especially that are not saved, um, this this hope that we have, this change that is taking place in us. It's to glorify God. It's like you're a walking billboard for Jesus Christ. Okay, let's take a look at a verse in Ephesians, Ephesians two ten. All right, if you're doing it to glorify yourself, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. It should always be for the glorification of God, the glory of God. So Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So these uh, good works are by the grace of God. Okay, The fact that we're even saved is by the grace of God. We're being led by the Holy Ghost because he dwells within us. Our good works should be a reflection of that. Okay, we talked about this before about uh, the structure of a family and about if a, if a woman is married to a non-believer, which you shouldn't do, but if you end up in that situation, you're a woman, you're married to a non-believer, your obedience to him, and by obedience I mean being in submission to him, recognizing his authority as the head of the household, could convert him in, in persuade him to come to Christ. In the same thing, we are, like I said, billboards for Christ. There's some people who will never ever go to church, never read a Bible, but they could see changes in us. They could see our actions, our words, and our thoughts, and how we deal with others, and, and our true motivations when we do good things, and that could win somebody to Christ. That's what this is all about, okay? Um, let's take a look at Matthew 5.16. Matthew 5.16. I've talked many times before, I'm sure, because it's one of my pet peeves. When I see people on Facebook putting up a picture or a video of themselves uh, handing some homeless person $20 or whatever else, it's disgusting to me. Absolutely disgusting. If you're doing it because you want a bunch of likes on Facebook or a pat on the back, then you are a miserable individual. Miserable, okay? I'm not impressed at all. And guess what? Neither is God. Neither is God, okay? All right, Matthew 5, 16, what does it say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Just what I was saying. When you do good things for the right reasons, it's a glorification to God, other men will see that and hopefully be drawn. They want to be a part of that. They see something in you that they don't have because they don't have this. Hopefully that will persuade them to come to Jesus, to trust on his blood. Be filled with that Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, you will do good things for the right reasons. Okay, And you'll be able to resist temptation. You'll be able to sin less, hopefully. That's what this is all about. And when you're doing those good works, it's a glorification to God. It's hopefully witnessing to lost sinners to bring them here. And when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you get those rewards. This is the ultimate way of being able to tell Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you did. You didn't have to, but you did it. Okay? Now let's take a look at another one. Um, Hebrews 10, 17. Again, Hebrews, one of my favorite books. Romans and Hebrews. I always go to those two books. A lot to unpack in both of them. They're both written by Paul. Some people would disagree that uh, Hebrews is written by Paul. And that's okay. Um, you're allowed to be wrong. I won't judge you. Okay? Uh, anyway. <laughs> that energy, energy drink starting to kick in. All right. Uh, Hebrews 10 17 what does it say and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more hmm why is that important well let's look at one more verse keep your finger there but now let's go to Jeremiah Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah 31 and we're going to look at verse 34 what does it say Jeremiah 31, 34. Ah, 
Okay. Well, that's a long verse. All right. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will, will, and I will remember their sin no more. I will remember their sin no more. I wanted to touch on this because when we get saved, like I said, you trust on the blood. The blood washes your sin away, right? So when we get up here to the judgment seat of Christ, again, we're not being judged for um, our salvation or if we belong there, whatever else, because our sins have already been washed away. In fact, Jesus God is saying here, I will remember their sin no more. And it's interesting that it's phrased that way. All right. Remember no more. Why is that interesting? Well, what if it just said that Jesus will forget or God will forget your sin? Well, if you forget something, there's a chance that sometime down the line, you'll remember, right? But if you choose to remember no more, that means you're never gonna call that back. You're never gonna recollect that event. Jesus, God, specifically worded it this way, remember no more. Which means that when you get here, it doesn't matter. Your sins have already been washed away. Like I said before, in one of my other videos, when I say, I don't ask forgiveness, when I pray, I do not ask forgiveness. I already have forgiveness. Yes, I'll pray and say, I'm sorry, and I pray for strength so I don't do the same sin, but I don't ask forgiveness. It's already been done. In fact, it's been done, and it's remembered no more. If I was to say to God, hey, Jesus, remember when I um, threw that book across the room yesterday because I was angry? He's going to say, no, I don't remember that. I'm like, no, it was just yesterday, remember? And I felt badly, and it broke the window. Sorry, I don't remember, because I remember no more. So how can I ask for forgiveness for something that Jesus, God, doesn't even remember? Okay? Remember no more. That's important. I love that verse. That's great. All right, let's go to Psalm 103. Here's another example. I love this verse, too. These all tie in. Psalm 103. Check this one out. This is a great verse. People quote this a lot, and I wonder if they truly understand the ramifications. Psalm 103, verse 12. What does it say? As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. When you get saved, when you get saved, so far has he removed that transgression from us as far as the east is from the west. Well, east and west, you can go forever, and they'll never touch point again. Okay? Ever. Jesus, God, will never remember your sins once you get saved. All right? So again, when you're coming here, it's not about answering for sin. It's about your, your due rewards. Now, when I talked about good or bad, it's just talking about your good intentions or bad intentions. Why did you do what you did? Not, not about your sins. They're already gone, washed away, as far as east from the west, remembered no more. It's just about rewards, okay? Um, I think I think hopefully you get that. We're going to go now and talk about the great white throne. All right. The great white throne again is for lost sinners, those who never come to Christ, those who never trust on the blood. They didn't get saved. This takes place after the millennial kingdom. Now briefly, what happens is and I believe, I say this all the time that we are right here that close to the rapture and the tribulation. Now we've talked before that two things must happen. The falling away, we see that already. Churches, ministers, Christians, they're falling away from the faith. Okay, um, itching ears. They don't want sound doctrine. They just tell me the good stuff. Tell me I'm going to be rich. Tell me I'm going to live my best life now. Okay, but that's falling away. All right, people who don't rightly divide. People who preach uh, who, who preach or teach doctrine that isn't true, like that you can lose your salvation, okay? That's a falling away. People who teach that uh, the Christians, the church, will go through the tribulation, that's a falling away. Paul was teaching a pre-trib rapture. 
the early church taught a pre-trib rapture. So if you're teaching something other than that, you're falling away. Okay? So the falling away has already happened. The second thing is the Antichrist will be revealed. So those two things have to happen before the rapture can take place. So all we're waiting for right now is for the Antichrist to be revealed. As soon as that happens, the, the man of sin, we talked about that, as soon as he's revealed, we're out of here. So we rapture out, and we're up here at the judgment seat of Christ, and then the marriage feast of the Lamb. Everyone else who didn't trust on the blood of Christ, they're going through this seven years of tribulation. All right? Seven years of tribulation. Now, people can get saved during the tribulation. They'll have to have their head cut off. They have their head cut off, they die, they're saved, they go to heaven. Okay? If they get saved and then turn around and take the mark of the beast, now they're in trouble. They lost their salvation. Or if they never come to Christ at all, okay, and they die, then they're going they're they're not gonna make it to heaven. Okay? So we have a bunch of things going on here during the tribulation. All right, there will be some who don't take the mark of the beast and they somehow survive the seven years living off the land. Those are the people who go into the millennial kingdom with mortal bodies, but because the curse will be lifted, Satan is locked in the pit for a thousand years. They still have a sin nature, but the curse has been lifted. These people will live to be five, six, seven, eight hundred years old and they'll be having children. Okay, those people. We who are raptured up or got saved during the tribulation, okay, we're up in heaven for that seven years while all this is going on down here. At Armageddon, we come down. Jesus then sets up his reign, his millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign during this time. These people that took the mark of the beast are being cast straight into hell. We talked about that before. That doesn't happen at the rapture, it happens here at Armageddon. Okay, those that, like I said, eat through, then they're coming through and they're going to live during the millennial kingdom. We will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Okay, we come down on the white horses with him. The battle of Armageddon takes place. We win, of course. And then we rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years over these people who eat through, okay, by the skin of their teeth, the seven year tribulation. And then they'll be having children. So that will keep growing and we'll rule and reign over them. At the end of time, at the end of that thousand years, Satan is released from the pit. He's loosed for a short period of time. There's one final battle. Okay? The devil loses, of course. He is then cast into the lake of fire. Now, all the people who are in hell, currently and in the future, at this point, they now come up here and they stand before the great white throne. And this is when Jesus says, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. They will. They could have been the most ardent atheist, but at this point, they're going to recognize just how much in error they were. They will kneel before Jesus. They will confess Jesus. And at this point, they will be judged for their works because they never trusted on the blood of Christ. So now everything that they've ever done is going to be played in front of everyone, including us. And at the end of that, they will say amen when God casts them into hell. All right? So, these people, because they trusted on their works, or they didn't trust on Jesus at all, they, they obviously aren't going to make it into heaven, because the only way is right here. So it's too late for them. They then are cast into hell, and then all of hell is cast into the lake of fire, and that's where they spend eternity, weeping and gnashing of the teeth. They never die. They are in eternal torment. Meanwhile, the rest of us are in heaven. Now, there's there's two different things about that. It talks about the new heaven and earth, right? New heaven and the new earth. Why is there a new heaven and a new earth? And which is there's a whole different topic we can go on. This we'll do that someday. Who's going to be in the new heaven and who's going to be on the new earth? That'll be another topic for another day. But anyway, just for the sake of saving time, we're all in heaven. That's where we spend eternity. These people spend eternity in the lake of fire because of the great white throne. We're going to take a, let's take a look at that. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to spend a lot of time in Revelation for this. 
because that's where it, uh, the great white throne is mostly mentioned, is in Revelation. Which makes sense. That's the last book of the Bible. That's, that's the last stop. Revelation 20. I'm going to look at verses 7 through 15. All right. Uh, okay. You know, it'd be good to read the verses before that, too, but I've already kind of explained it. It's talking about, you should read all of chapter 20. All right. It's talking about when, when Satan is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. Um, it talks about the people who took the mark of the beast and uh, the thousand year reign of Christ. Okay, Everything I just talked about. So now we're picking up when Satan is loosed, like I said, after that thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now you got to ask yourself, well, who are these people that he's gathering up? Because it's not us. We're ruling and reigning with Christ. We already have glorified bodies. We no longer have a sin nature. So we can't fall, ever. We already made it. These people who eat through the tribulation without taking the mark and somehow survived, they're the ones that go into the millennial kingdom they're having children. And remember, these people live hundreds of years. And their kids have kids, and kids, and kids, and kids. It says, as uh, uh, the number is like the sand. Okay? So there's a lot of people being born. Uh, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Those are the people. Some of these people in the millennial kingdom, even though Satan is locked away for a thousand years, they still have a mortal body. They still have a sin nature. Some of them are going to fall away. Maybe even most of them are going to fall away. And remember, at any time, Jesus is ruling with a rod during this time. He's not putting up with a whole lot. So if you mess up during the Millennial Kingdom, you better re repent right away. Say you're sorry. Ask forgiveness because it's different here, different dispensation. You better get right really fast. And you better try to not do that again. Because at any point, if you're sinning over and over and over, and you're not remorseful, or it's a, a really bad sin, or whatever, Jesus can throw you into hell at any point, at any time. He can just say, enough, cast you into hell. But there'll be some, at the very end, they told the line, they do what they're supposed to, we, have, we know people like that. They do exactly what they need to do just to get through the, to the very end, and then when Satan is loosed here, he gathers up his armies. There will be people here that turn against Christ. They will align themselves with Satan for that final battle. And that's what it's talking about here. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It's not going to be a very long battle at all. They're going to they're going to gather up the armies. Satan, he's going to gather them all up. They're going to be ready to go into battle. And Jesus is going to... Uh, uh, throw fire. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah. Alright? So, it doesn't take long. We'll keep going. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Antichrist is the beast. False prophet. That's a story for another day. We'll get to that. That's an interesting story too. And it should be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do not let anyone tell you that there's no such thing as hell or that when you go to hell you just die and it's done. No. Forever and ever. Tormented. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no found and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. These are the people coming up out of hell. The ones who never accepted Jesus. Never trusted on his blood. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. And that's a story for another day. I can run a million rabbit trails with this stuff. Those are uh, Bible studies for, for a future time. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Like I said, they never trusted on Jesus, so all they have is their works. And they'll stand there and say, well, I helped this old lady across the street. I gave money to the Red Cross. Uh, all kinds of stuff. That's fine. But remember, just one sin disqualifies you. Just one sin. And I'm going to give you um, an analogy here toward the end. Okay? 
excuse me, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Eternal torment in the lake of fire. You don't want to go there. Trust me. According to their works. You don't want to trust on your works at all. Ever. Not now and not in the future. Alright. So let's go to Revelation 2.23. What does it say? And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. There it is again. This is Jesus talking. He's saying, I'm going to give to you exactly what you deserve based on your works. And I'm going to give an analogy later, but you really, I don't care how many great things you've done, you do not want to stand before Christ before God and try to say I earned my way into heaven because of all these great things I did it will not get you there one thing will get you there one only trusting on the blood of Jesus that's it okay Revelation 18 6 and if these verses don't convince you of that then I don't know what will Revelation 18 6 Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she had filled to her double. Again, based on your works, you don't want to go there. It's not going to work. Well. It's not going to end well for you. Revelation 22, 12. 22, 12. What does it say? This is Jesus talking. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. You don't want that. You don't want to stand before Jesus out here and, and try to get into heaven based on your works. It's not going to happen. The blood of Jesus, that cloak of righteousness, that imputed righteousness because of trusting on the death, burial, and resurrection, that is the only way you'll ever make it into heaven. All right? Uh, let's take a look at a, a verse, um, Isaiah 64, 6. This is what God thinks of your, your good works. Because if you think, oh, I'll just, I've done so many good things. This is what Jesus thinks of your good works. What God thinks of your good works. Isaiah 64. I'm sure most people are familiar with this verse. 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our good works are but filthy rags to God. Now, this is in terms of salvation, not so much your good works up here. Again, we're talking about these folks here, lost sinners um, after the millennial kingdom going to the great white throne. Your good works are as filthy rags. Now, I don't want to get into too much. I'm not comfortable with this kind of stuff, but it's important to give context. Filthy rags is basically the ancient equivalent of a tampon or a maxi pad that has been used. Okay, and I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, um, but that is what God is equating your good works, your righteousness for salvation. That's what he's equating it to. Okay? That's what God says. He said it. That's what he thinks. All right? So don't count on your good works because they mean nothing to him as far as this here. All right? Uh, let's go back to Revelation. Uh, Revelation 17.8. I'm going to touch on something that was in one of the other verses. I don't want to spend a lot of time there. It's a topic for another day. But Revelation 17.8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, we talked about that, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Again, a lot to unpack, but we're not going to spend a lot of time there. I'm using this for the fact of the book of life. The book of life, you want to be in the book of life. How do you get there? Uh, trusting. Now, 
here's the thing, because it talks about, in other verses, about um, being removed from the book of life, no longer being in the book of life. I believe that when you are born, everyone, uh, and I'm not a good artist, but let's pretend like this, let's see if I can do it. I don't know. Pretend like this is a book. Okay? Book. When you are born, your name goes into the book of life. You're automatically in. That's why I said before, if you die before the age of accountability, the maturity level, you automatically get to go to heaven. Okay? But if you are a sound mind and, and you have that maturity level, if you never come to Jesus, if you never ever trust on that blood, then it says your name will be blotted out. Uh-oh. That guy lost. This gal lost. They're no longer there. Now when they're standing up here, their name's not in the book of life. They don't get to go to heaven. They're going right over here, lake of fire. So again, this is a topic for another day, but it all ties in. But that is how I believe and what I interpret, what I get from the Bible. And, and again, it's of no private interpretation. Comparing scripture with scripture, most people, I think, agree that your name will be blotted out if you never come to the atoning blood of Jesus. All right? So I, I just wanted to touch on that. Topic for another day, though. Let's go to Romans. So we're going to step outside of Revelation for a second. Uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. What does it say? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up for the, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Again, these are people who never trusted on the blood of Christ. Okay? Um, you are basically, you are conjuring up your own judgment against yourself by not trusting on the blood of Christ, by believing in your works, by trying to keep the law or the commandment. You are basically building a case against yourself. Now, here in America, we have what's called the Fifth Amendment, where you don't have to testify against yourself. Okay, it doesn't work the same way here. Okay, when you don't come to Jesus, when you don't trust on the death, burial, and resurrection, you are building a case against yourself for when you stand here. Okay, now I said I was going to give an analogy. Let's now look, God is a just God. Okay, and we've talked before how even one sin disqualifies you from heaven. And you can say, well, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, I did 10,000 good things, and I sinned one time, which I doubt that, but let's pretend you only sinned one time. Why, if I only sinned one time, how come these 10,000 good things don't compensate, more than compensate for that? Why can't I get into heaven? Well, let me ask you this. Let's pretend, and we're going to have to pretend, that there's a judge here on earth who is just who isn't corrupt, who hasn't been bought and paid for. Again, we're pretending. But let's pretend that there's a judge like that that actually exists. Okay? And you uh, have been convicted of murder. And, and all the evidence is there. You may even, you, you even uh, agree. You even uh, uh, pled guilty. Okay? So you are guilty of killing one person. Now, as your defense, you then stand before the judge and you say, look, yes, I killed this one guy, but look at all these people I, I didn't kill. And you start bringing through all your friends, your family, people you work with, okay? You bring through 500 people that you didn't kill. And then you say to the judge, see, there's 500 people here I didn't kill, I killed one. Now, if this judge is just, would he say, yeah, you're right, you know what, uh, 500, that's a lot more than one, so yeah, you're." You're, you're, you're free to go. No. Yes, there's 500 or 5,000 or 5 million people that you never killed, but you killed that one person, and you need to be held accountable for that. Okay? The same thing here. Your one sin disqualified you. Yes, you can say, I never committed all these sins. I only committed one. Well, when you commit one, you've broken them all just like we would do here on earth. It doesn't matter that you've not killed 10 million people. If you've killed just one, you're going to be held accountable, or you should be. 
the same thing. That's an analogy uh, that I think, that I hope, puts it into perspective for you. So what you need then is for someone to take your place. What if you're found guilty and the, and the judge says, you know, he slams down the gavel, guilty. But then, what if he took off his robe and he came down and he stood next to you and said, but I'm going to take your punishment for you. I'm going to go to prison in your place. Or I'm going to go to the death, uh, the electric chair, whatever, in your place. That's what Jesus did. We were guilty. He came down from heaven and took our spot. He took our place. Now, if that doesn't move you, I don't know what will. He took my place. I deserve hell many times over. But he took that for me. He did it for you too. If you haven't come to Christ, I don't understand you. I, I, I can't I can't even uh, uh, I can't even put myself in the same headspace as you. This is your means to heaven, okay? If you haven't come to Jesus, what are you waiting for? Trust on the death, burial, and resurrection. Trust on the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. And you won't have to deal with all this out here. Okay? Like I said, we're this close to the rapture. It can happen at any moment. Okay? So don't put it off. Get it done. If you are saved, what are you doing? What have you done to bring others here? Because as you stand by and watch other people continue to be lost, here at the Great White Throne Judgment, we, the saved people, will be standing around there. We'll be standing around watching as God judges these people and will watch as he throws them into the lake of fire. That means your neighbor that you never witnessed to, your uncle that you never witnessed to, your niece that you never witnessed to. You will watch someday as they're cast into hell. And when they turn to you at that point and they say to you, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me? What are you going to say? Now, granted, I've said it before, you won't have to take that memory into eternity because once they're cast into the lake of fire, all of this is burned up and gone. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. And our memory will be reset to where we only know and remember the people that are in heaven with us. So you won't have to take that into eternity. I'm not trying to scare you. But at one point in time, even if it's for five minutes, you're going to watch as numerous people that you may or may not know are cast into hell. And some of them you will be responsible for. Some of them I'm responsible for. Because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. What are you doing? I know that there's comfort zones for certain people. I've said it before though. It's, it, it's no stretch to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. To like and share these videos. And if these videos get somebody saved, you played a part in that. Okay? Again, rewards. Alright? So I ask that you would subscribe to this channel. That you would like and share these videos you could be saving somebody's eternal soul okay and if you can, and if you do have a larger comfort zone then hand out some tracks witness to people go soul winning just get the message out there do videos make do whatever you got to do just get the word out there okay because there's a lot of people that we know will be standing right here all right, I'm going to wrap up this video now, and then I'm going to start the next one. But I want to thank you all uh, for your comments. For, for those of you that do like, share, subscribe, thank you very much. Um, again, if you have questions, comments, whatever else, uh, leave it in the comments below. And uh, uh, you can email me. Find me on Facebook. I always, I've been remembering to put that at the end, so you can find me on Facebook. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Um, praying for you. I pray that you have a great day, great week. Um, and uh, yeah, amen. God bless.